Hi everybody, welcome to your Nidaria and Tenophora video notes. So we're going to outline basically mostly the jellyfish, but there's a couple other species that will also be included. So we're once again in Kingdom Animalia, the rest of this class we focus on that kingdom. First we're going to talk about phylum Nidaria. Notice the C is silent, so Nidaria, starting with an N, and that name itself means stinging nettle in Latin. Then we're going to talk briefly about phylum Tenophora. Once again, C is silent, so start with a T. And that name means comb bearing, and those are your comb jellies. So first up, phylum Nidaria characteristics. So phylum Nidaria has radial symmetry. Their oral end or their mouth end is surrounded by tentacles, and they don't have an actual nervous system. Instead, they have a nerve net. And we're still in organisms with two tissue layers. So there's an epidermis, which is your outer layer, and there's a gastrodermis, which is your inner layer. They also have something called mesoglia, which is in between those two tissue layers. So very similar structurally to sponges, but they're a little more jelly-like, hence the name jellyfish, right? And they also have something called a gastrovascular cavity, which acts as the stomach. So gastro... Two is a really good reminder, gastro means stomach. Phylum tenophora then is a little bit different. So these are spherical shaped, but they can also be a flattened or kind of an elongated structure. They do not have nematocysts, which are those stinging cells of nadarians. They have something called coloblasts instead. And these aren't stinging, they're just sticky. They're like an adhesive. So they stick to their prey and bring it into their mouth, but they don't actually sting it, which is why they're not nadarians. They're also known for something pretty cool called their bioluminescence, which you see down here. And these are just light producing cells that are in their digestive canal that give them that really cool like movement of colors. And these are also unique in that they swim with their oral end or their mouth end upward. So if you look in this picture, the mouth is actually at the top of the body. So let's talk about nadarians. We're back to nadarians now, their body forms. So they have two major forms to their body. They have a polyp form and a medusa form. And some of these species go through both of these forms in their lifetime. Some strictly exist in polyp form and some strictly ex exist in medusa form. And we'll get into that in a couple minutes. First, let's go over the basics. So polyp form is like this picture here, whoops. And it's kind of your typical like sea anemone that you would think of. So they're tube shaped with an upward facing mouth and they have those tentacles in a whirl or a circle around their mouth. They do, however, spend most of their life sessile, meaning they don't move. They typically attach somewhere and that's where they stay. They can, however, detach if a predator is coming their way, which I'll show you in a second. They can also somersault, so tentacles to bottom to tentacles, or they can actually turn over and walk on their tentacles. So here's an image of a sea anemone detaching. The starfish are actually kind of some fierce predators in the ocean, so they will hunt down sea anemones and they will try to eat them. So that anemone actually detaches and swims away. And it's also important to note that nadarians in the polyp form reproduce asexually. All right, so medusa form. The medusa form is the opposite of a polyp. So instead of the mouth and the tentacles facing up, we switch and they face down. So I think of Medusa, the crazy lady with all the snakes in her hair, right? So the snakes were on top and then her mouth was below the snakes. So that's how you can kind of think of the medusa form. They have very limited movement, which is important to note. So horizontally, they're really just moving with the water currents or the winds. They really can't control where they go, which is why you frequently see jellyfish like beach. They're on the beaches and things like that because they get brought in by the waves and they really can't swim their way back out. They can, though, swim a little bit vertically in the water column so they can go up and down. And the medusa form reproduces sexually. So here's just a quick clip showing you a jellyfish moving vertically in the water column. All right, now let's talk a little more about the cells that Adarians have that make them so special. So I briefly mentioned nidocytes. Once again, that C is silent. Nidocytes are these specialized stinging cells they have in their epidermis. So focus on this picture here. And if I were you, I would actually draw this or label it on your organizer. So this is the stinging cell itself. Well, pay attention to this darker purpley red color here because that is the actual stinging component or 
draw an arrow here, the nematocyst. So this is inside of those nematocytes, and it actually releases on touch. So when it releases, it sticks out this little guy here, this thread, and then it has these spines. It's almost like a harpoon. If you imagine like old whaling, um, seeing videos of whaling where they throw a harpoon, right? It's attached to a rope. So same thing. And this is how they sting you. And so that alone, just by touching them, of course, that can happen, but also a, like a chemical can cause them to release those. And those spines are filled with the toxin, which is what makes them hurt so bad. So here's just a look at how this, this process happens. So this picture is part one. So you see the little trigger up here at the top, it touches the skin and that's that physical sensation like, oh, I need to sting you, you're a threat. So then we go on to picture two, which is you see that harpoon or that thread, that's what goes into your body and causes so much pain. And it's also important to note that even if like tentacles and stuff are released from the body of a jellyfish, they can still sting you. So they don't even have to be attached to the body of a jellyfish to cause pain. Now, they have these really cool things. Most of us avoid jellyfish. We want nothing to do with them. They do still have a natural predator in sea turtles. So sea turtles actually really like to prey on jellyfish. They eat them and they're kind of immune to all of that stinging. But a little bit back to ecology and humans and our environmental impact, that jellyfish looks an awful lot like a plastic bag. So that's why plastic bags also cause so many problems with turtles because they can't tell the difference. All right, so in addition to those cells, they are, like I said, capable of some basic coordinated movement, and they have a nerve network, a very loose nerve network called a nerve net. They don't have a brain. They don't have actual like nerve cells and nerve cords and things like that that more advanced organisms have, but they do have this loose network. And this network can spread a stimulus across the whole body to communicate with the animal. Reproduction is another thing that's kind of interesting with nadarians. So they are dioecious, meaning there's male and female organs in separate individuals. So this is different than our sponges that we talked about, but they typically have external fertilization. So the egg and the sperm are released, they fertilize, and that embryo eventually creates something called a planula. That planula is what's going to attach to a substrate and form a polyp. And polyps are kind of they're like little anemones. They look like little trees. So the polyp is going to attach and form that structure. From there, the polyp is going to bud and produce these little medusa. It's kind of, they just kind of pop off and produce these little medusa. The polyp can also just simply stay there and keep reproducing and making more polyps, which is how nadarians are still capable of asexual reproduction. All right, we're going to get into the classification now. So there are five different groups of jellyfish that we're going to talk about. First, we're going to start with class Anthozoa. So these are your sea anemones. They can be colonial or they can be solitary, but they don't have that medusa stage. So they only have the polyp stage and they are only marine. They are not found in freshwater. It's also important to note that this is the largest nadarian class and there's actually over 6,000 species of Anthozoa. And structurally, they are slightly different from other nadarians in that they actually go to a pharynx after food enters the mouth before going into that gastrovascular cavity or that stomach structure. Anthozoans in general are pretty cool too because they have a lot of really neat symbiotic relationships. So there's two major types of anthozoas. There's corals and then there's your sea anemones. Your corals have this really cool photosynthetic green algae inside of them that gives them all their bright colors. Well, the coral provides, of course, a safe home for this algae because if you look over here, the blue is the outside and then the zooanthelle zoo is inside. So that's protected by the outside of the coral and they can live in there and be happy. They also help with photosynthesis. Algae, on the other hand, does still help the coral too because it provides oxygen via photosynthesis and it also helps remove waste. But coral bleaching is also a factor here because when coral become bleached, that's when those algae move out. Their coral is no longer a safe home for them, so they move out and then the coral actually die as a result. 
Sea anemones, on the other hand, everyone knows about clownfish, right? Clownfish live inside sea anemone, finding Nemo, all of that. But they also do something cool where they will attach themselves to hermit crabs. And the hermit crabs move, so then they get to move. And then they also get some of the food items as hermit crabs eat. And then there's just an example of our clownfish. And clownfish is actually a mutualistic relationship because the clownfish use the anemones for protection, but the clownfish swim and they filter and bring in water and food particles to the anemone for food as well. All right, next up, class Scyphozoa. So these are known as your true jellyfish because the medusa is the dominant stage and some of them don't even have a polyp stage. These are once again marine only and they're typically orange or pink except for moon jellies over here, which are so cool. I love moon jellies, but they live worldwide. So these live all over the world, but they love beaches. And these are the ones to beware of because if they have a helmet shape or long tentacles, those are the ones that are gonna cause you some pain if you come into contact with them. Next is a newer class, class Storozoa. So these are known as stalked jellyfish. So they kind of look like a mix between a sea anemone and a jellyfish upside down. And they're different because they attach to seaweeds or rocks, but they're mostly anti-tropical, meaning they like cold water. So they prefer polar or boreal waters. So think Canada, Alaska, Russia, all of those places are going to be where these jellyfish prefer to live. And they're typically a goblet or trumpet shape. And they have eight tentacles that surround their mouth. And they also don't have that Medusa adult stage. Next is class Cubozoa. So these are pretty cool too. They have a cube shaped body and they have specifically 15 tentacles on each side with 24 eyes, which is kind of crazy to think about, six on each side. But even more strange of these eyes, 20 are considered simple, but four are complex, kind of like ours. They can actually like see versus just sensing light and dark like they're simple eyes. They are active swimmers. So these are the ones that don't just rely on that water movement. They actually hunt their prey and they can get up to 4.6 miles per hour, which is pretty fast for like a blob of jelly in the ocean. They do live in warm tropical waters. And it's important to note box jelly is one you're gonna hear a lot because these are like really, really, really poisonous, even to humans. A lot of humans, once they're stung by a box jellyfish, they'll actually drown or have a heart attack from so much pain of the venom before they even make it to shore to say, hey, I got stung, I need help. So their venom is super, super bad and they're like 10 feet long. So you don't want to mess with box jellies. And then lastly, we have class Hydrozoa. So these are your small, relatively common nadarians, and these are probably ones you've seen before. They mostly exist, though, in colonies with specialized regions. So even though this picture over here looks like a jellyfish, it actually is kind of a colony of a bunch of little polyps that have specialized functions in feeding and budding and defense. And these are mostly marine, but there are also a few freshwater species, such as the green hydra, and then the Portuguese man of war is what you see over there. And those are the ones that you see that are like that really, really bright turquoise purple color that wash up on the beaches in Florida all the time. So those are pretty, pretty uh, painful as well if you get stung by one of those. All right, that is it for your notes.